Welcome back, everybody. We're going to talk about another very common rheumatic disorder here, and that is systemic lupus erythematosus, commonly referred to shorthandedly as SLE or just lupus. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking on the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications as I put more and more videos up. All right, so just an overview of lupus here. This is a chronic inflammatory multisystemic disease in which arthritis is one of a myriad of possible symptoms and presentations. A patient coming in with just arthritis, even if it's small joint arthritis, even if it's inflammatory, and if they have no other symptoms, it's not lupus. They need to have other symptoms. It affects approximately a quarter million people in the U.S. and growing. People of color tend to be affected at higher rates than whites, and women are absolutely more affected than men uh, by about a nine to one ratio. So look for a young woman, uh, maybe a young white woman, young woman of color coming in with joint pain and a fever and a rash. It is idiopathic. The classic triad, however, is fever, joint pain, and a rash. And that rash can come in a variety of forms. Most commonly, it's a malar rash. However, it can be discoid, and often these patients will get rashes if they spend too much time in the sun. Ultimately, this is a diagnosis that's clinical and supported by laboratory evidence, very similar to RA in that regard. This is the malar rash. This is why it's called lupus. Uh, lupus comes from the Latin word for wolf, and I guess they think that this looks like a wolf's face. Um, so you see it in the upper cheeks and nasal bridge. This is a discoid rash. Um, so it's a little bit different. It tends to come in these plaques. They're well circumscribed, um, sort of, uh, they, they can get um, kind of this, what you might call keratinization uh, on the rash or um, on the, uh, the periphery of the rash, you can get this erythema. So um, this is another form of rash that can come in lupus. So these are the manifestations. You can see that there are just absolutely a ton of them. Um, so I put in red the more common ones um, and the ones you really want to keep an eye out for. Here's the diagnostic criteria, and the mnemonic here is Soap Brain MD. Now, there's other mnemonics um, that you might find helpful as well. Um, you can rearrange the letters in a lot of different ways, um, but this is the one I was taught. So look for serositis. That can be um, uh, pleurisy, uh, may uh, be the presenting sign of that. Oral ulcers, these are just aphthous ulcers, um, canker sores that you get, you know, a lot of people get. Arthritis, as mentioned, photosensitivity, basically a photosensitive rash. Uh, blood disorders, so usually it's anemia, but it can be a, a, um, a lymphopenia, and it can be a thrombocytopenia, or it can be all of them. Uh, renal dysfunction, look for an elevated B1 and creatinine, look for uh, casts, protein in the urine. Um, that's showing you there's something wrong at the level of the glomeruli. ANA, that's going to be part of our orders. That's a very sensitive test, uh, but not very specific. Immunologic phenomenon, we'll talk about this. Smith antigen, or uh, it could be just called anti-Smith. I think that's how it comes up on your CCS, so we'll put that. And then anti-DSDNA. These are specific, but not quite as sensitive. Neurologic symptoms, not otherwise explained. Uh, malar rash and a discoid rash. This is the frequency. It may differ a little bit from the previous slide, but uh, you can. this is a lifetime frequency. So um, remember that SLE is a syndrome. So you're never gonna have all of them. Uh, you may have a few of them, or you may have a lot of them. It really just uh, depends on your presentation. So remember with these syndromes, you're never gonna have all of the signs. Uh, you gotta look for um, sort of the constellation that you're dealing with. So make sure to get an OB history in every female uh, who comes in that you're suspecting RA because a history of miscarriages is suspicious for antiphospholipid syndrome, which coincides often with SLE. If you're suspecting SLE, the best initial diagnostic test is an ANA. ANA is kind of a screening test for a lot of these uh, autoantibodies. So if the ANA comes back negative, it's almost certainly not lupus. Um, it's very sensitive though. So if the ANA comes back positive, then you want to get those anti-Smith and anti-DSDNA serologies because they're more specific. 
So I would start out like this. I would get a CBC and a BMP to start out to get a sed rate because this is probably, this is often inflammatory. And lupus is always inflammatory, but we're looking at arthritis here. Uh, get that ANA, get a urinalysis because we're looking at renal function. Uh, the BU and creatinine will help you there, but the urinalysis is more definitive at telling you if you have renal damage. Get a PTT uh, looking for antiphospholipid syndrome. And then you can get other tests depending on the symptoms. So if they're coming in with a cough, if they're coming in with chest pain, you know, just use your clinical judgment. And what you will usually see with CBC is you can see a reduction in one of the cell lines. Most commonly, it's going to be a normocytic anemia, anemia of chronic disease. BMP will often show an elevated BU and creatinine. SED rate will be elevated. CRP would be elevated if you ordered that. ANA will always be positive in lupus. Uh, urinalysis will show signs of nephritis in many cases. PTT may be prolonged. And then the others, um, just like I said, use common sense here. You know, if we're looking at an effusion, you'll see that on chest x-ray uh, and so forth. Further workup, the anti-Smith, anti-DSDNA, and if there's proteinuria, you want to consult ne nephrology. But, uh, so you're not just going to order the renal biopsy, uh, but you should know that that's where we're going to be headed if there are signs of serious renal impairment. The cornerstone of lupus treatment is hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs. Hydroxychloroquine not for COVID, okay? Hydroxychloroquine is for lupus and for some other disorders, but particularly lupus. So hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs. You should always start hydroxychloroquine in every patient unless there's contraindications. It is the only drug that improves survival with lupus. So we'll give them hydroxychloroquine. We'll give them naproxen. Naproxen is superior to ibuprofen. Um, so give naproxen. You want to counsel them to avoid the sun, use sunscreen, counsel them about the side effects of the medication because there are a lot with hydroxychloroquine, and then refer them to rheumatology and nephrology. Steroids can be added to hydroxychloroquine and NSAIDs if those alone cannot control the symptoms. And then mycophenolate should be used in place of hydroxychloroquine in patients with lupus nephritis that's been confirmed. So if you get a renal biopsy, they have lupus nephritis, you should give them mycophenolate instead. And we used to say give cyclophosphamide, um, but now mycophenolate is given um, because there are fewer adverse effects, just a better safety profile. There are some other drugs out there not going to be on your exam. Now, with pregnancy and lupus, uh, you should always test women at some point in their pregnancy for the anti-Rho antibody because if that's positive, then uh, that confers a higher risk of the baby developing neonatal lupus. Remember what anti-Rho is usually tested for? It's usually tested for Sjogren syndrome. It's also called anti-SSA. Um, so, uh, but we do this in pregnant women with lupus. Pregnant patients should continue their hydroxychloroquine through the pregnancy. However, NSAIDs and methotrexate have to be avoided, especially methotrexate. I mean, if you can't have take methotrexate and have a normal pregnancy. After the first trimester, start them on low-dose aspirin. It reduces the risk of preeclampsia and low molecular weight heparin if they have a history of a thrombotic event or antiphospholipid syndrome that's been established. Neonatal lupus. You don't need to know a whole lot about this. Uh, what you need to know, though, is that it commonly presents as a heart block and a rash that could be malar or discoid. Um, diagnosis here is to get the anti rho antibodies in the baby. And then the treatment is basically symptomatic. So if they have a heart block, you do a pacing device. Otherwise, symptomatic control, rash, steroids, NSAIDs should be avoided. And we also want to avoid corticosteroids and immunosuppressants if we can. This resolves on its own. So here you can see a baby with uh, what appears to be a discoid rash. Drug-induced lupus is a lupus-like syndrome. However, they will never develop renal dysfunction. Uh, they won't have anti-DSDNA or anti-Smith. Um, so it looks like lupus as far as the arthralgias and rash, um, but look for a patient who has recently been on a drug that they recently started. And these are some of the major uh, associated drugs. Um, you can see it's kind of a random selection here. The best initial and most accurate test, this is what you really need to know, is the antihistone antibody. Antihistone antibody is associated with drug-induced lupus. And the treatment here is just to discontinue the offending drug.